Hello again, Dr. Stevens here, and today we're going to be talking about conditional probability, marginal probability, and joint probability, and how it relates to something called Bayes' theorem. This is relevant for probability calculations in general. It also comes up on decision trees that have research branches. So we're going to use the example that we had of Sean and his job offer that we talked about in part one and part two of decision trees to develop this idea too. How do you do the work? Well, let's take a look at the information that we've got, which is a little different than the information that we used on the tree in the last example. Here's the information that Sean actually had in order to start with, and then we'll figure out how he got what he needed. Sean knows that there's a 50% chance that he'll be offered job A, and a 60% chance that he'll be offered job B, but knowing whether he'll be offered one job actually gives him information about how desirable he is for the other one. Job A is more competitive than job B, but in either case, finding out that he's accepted for one job increases the chances that he'll also be acceptable for the other. Finding out that he's not acceptable for one job will lower that probability. We want to figure out exactly how much. So we have the job that he has a 50% chance of getting A and a 60% chance of being offered B, but if he is offered A, that chance of being offered B goes from 60% up to 80%. Well, if he's not offered B, there's only a 25% chance of being offered A. Well, the trouble is, is that a lot of this information is not what we really need. After all, job A is his favorite, so if he is offered job A, then he'll be taking it, and he doesn't really care what the chances are of being offered B. On the other hand, if he is offered job B, he'd be very interested in knowing how likely it is that an A offer will come through too. Because if he turns B down now, then he won't get the opportunity to have A. I'm sorry, he won't get the opportunity to have job B if A doesn't work out. So how can we do this? Well, the first thing that we notice is that there are two different pairs of chance events in this problem. The chance of being offered A or not, and the chance of being offered B or not. So I'm going to make up a table here, a two by two table, with labels that fit that. On the row labels, I have A is offered or A is not. On the column labels, B is offered or B is not. Now, in this particular case, we only have two options for each one. Either A is yes or A is no, and the same for B. But there's nothing about this technique that requires that. Maybe we would have something like A says yes, or A says no, there's no job for you, or A says, ah, we might have something, we'll call you back. But that doesn't occur in this particular problem. Notice, however, that the things in the column have to form what's called a set of cases. Either A is offered or it is not. Exactly one of those statements has to be true. Either B is offered or it is not. Again, exactly one of those statements has to be true. Whatever goes across the top, whatever goes down the side. In each case, you have to be able to say that exactly one of those things is going to happen. So, for example, labels like A yes and B yes in the same direction wouldn't work because maybe they're both true or maybe neither one is. Okay, I've labeled this table probability of row and column, and we'll come back and talk about what that means in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to make two more tables as well, one that's in the same row as the table that I just made, and one that's in the same column as the table that I just made, and both of these will have labels that match up with the original table. For the rows, I have A yes and A no. For the columns, I have B yes and B no. But that's where the similarity ends, because each table also has its own name. We talked about the first table being named probability of row and column. The one that shares a row with it is called probability of column given row. The one that shares a column with it is called probability of row given column. It's important to get the labels in the right place. The way I remember it is by saying these two tables share a row direction, so the row is given, while these two tables share a column direction, and therefore the column is given. Whatever helps you remember it, that'll be fine. I'm also going to add a little bit more to this chart by adding a couple of boxes at the end of each row and the bottom of each column of that first table, like this. These boxes are going to hold the row and column totals for that row, so this cell plus this cell is going to add to that one, and this cell plus this cell is going to add up to that one, and so on. All right, before I can use these tables, I have to have a better sense of what they mean. So I'm going to talk to you about five different locations in this table and tell you what each one of these locations means. Let's start with this cell right here, the one that I'm temporarily turning red. Oops, sorry. Um, I'll just put a border around it here for now. What's that cell telling you? 
Well, it's an AND table, so it's telling you the probability that both of these events are true, that A is in fact offered and that B is also offered. How likely is it that Sean will get offers from both people? This cell, for example, will tell you how likely is it that Sean gets an offer from no offer from A or B. All right, fine. How about the corresponding location in the bottom table, this one down here? What does that mean? Well, we're told that the column is given. The column being given means that we know that B is going to be offered. Given that B is going to be offered, this cell will tell us how likely is it that A is also offered. Given that the column event did occur, how likely is it that the row event will occur? So if B is offered, how likely is it that he's also going to be offered A? That's what this tells you. How about the corresponding location on this table over here, this cell right here? Here, the row is given. So what I know for sure is that yes, he is offered job A. I'm saying given that A is offered, how likely is it that B is offered too? How likely is it that the column event occurs given that the row event occurred? So if I know that he's offered A, how likely is he's going to get B as well? All right, two more boxes to talk about. How about these shaded ones that are at the end of the rows and columns? Well, we already talked about the fact that this box, for example, represents the sum of this row, this cell plus this cell. It turns out that it also has another meaning, though. The box at the end of a row or column in this table represents the probability of the thing that heads that row or column. That is, this cell tells me the probability that he will be offered the job A. This cell tells me the probability that he will be offered the job B, and so on. Okay, let's see then, out of the information that we're told, what cells we can fill in. Now, just a little bit of a spoiler alert for general problems. In most research branch problems, if these things are the outcomes of your research, and these things are the things that you're trying to predict, then you'll usually find out that they'll give you the information in this table, and they'll give you the information in these boxes. But what you'll need for your decision tree is the information in these boxes and the information in this table over here. However, I can make crop problems that don't fit that model, and in fact our current problem doesn't. So you'll want to be a bit more comfortable with figuring out where things go. Let's figure out what belongs where. We're told there's a 50% chance of being offered job A. So that goes in the box at the end of the A yes, call, uh, yes row. There's a 50% chance that he's going to be offered A. Let's make that appear here. Sorry about that. Here we go. 50% chance of being offered job A. Of course, that means there's also a 50% chance that he's not offered job A. There's a 0.5 right here. And you'll notice that that makes perfectly good sense because something has to happen. Either A is offered or it is not. What else are we told? We're told this is a 60% chance he'll be offered job B. Well, once again, the probability at the end of a column tells you the probability of the thing that heads that column. How likely is it he's offered job B? 60%. Because it's 60%, that means that there's a 40% chance that he won't be offered job B. Make that appear as well. Hang on. There we go. Okay. Notice that, by the way, this column has to add up to the value of 1, and this row has to add up to the value of 1. I can do that, make that kind of a little clearer by maybe doing a little formatting like this. This column will always add to 1. This row will always add to 1. The four white cells I have up here will always add to 1. It might not be four, it might be more than that, if I have more than two rows or columns, but that entire table is going to add up to one. So that's what we've got so far. We've used these first two statements. What else do we have? Now we've got a conditional statement. If he is offered job A, there's an 80% chance he'll also be offered job B. Take a second and see if you can figure out what table this goes in. The thing I know for sure is that he's offered job A. So I know about A, and A appears in the rows of my table. So I want to say that given that the row event is true, given that he is offered job A, there's an 80% chance that he's also going to be offered job B. Now, 80% of the time, if he's offered A, he'll also be offered B. That means that 20% of the time something happens. What is it? 80% of the time when he's offered A, he's also offered B. That means 20% of the time, when he's offered A, he's not offered B. Where would that go? Again, same logic. Given that he is offered A, there's a 20% chance of not being offered B. It belongs right here in this cell. And you'll notice that that row itself adds up to 1. This is not coincidence. The rows of this table over here will always add up to 1. 
Can we do the second row? Well, not yet. We need some more numbers. Let's see what else we're told. We're told that if he's not offered job B, there's only a 25% chance of him being offered job A. Again, take a second and see if you can figure out where this information belongs. The given information is that he's not offered job B. The given is in the column. He's not offered job B. This is the table that says if the column is given, how likely is the row? Given that he's not offered job B, the chance that he is offered job A is only 25%. That's the number that goes here. Well, this says when he's not offered B, there's a 25% chance that he's being offered A. That means if he's not offered B, there's a 75% chance that he's not offered A either. I'm sorry, that's not a 0.15, that's a 0.75. That column adds up to 1 as well. And again, that's not a coincidence. The columns of this table down here always add to 1, just like the rows over here do. And of course, all the white cells over here add up to 1. All right, that's all the information that we were given. Let's see if we can fill in the rest of the cells in this table and interpret what they mean. I'm going to go through an explanation of why the argument works right now, but then when we come back, uh, when we come back to how we actually do it, it's simply going to be arithmetic. I want to figure out what number belongs in this cell here. Okay, What's that cell going to tell me? It tells me, given that job A, I'm sorry, given how likely is it that these two things are both true? First, that job A is offered, and second, that job B is not offered. How can I get that? Well, I have to satisfy two conditions. Let's start down here and look at this. I'm going to imagine that we start with a hundred different phone calls coming into Sean. I'm looking for the two conditions that yes, he is offered A, and no, he is not offered B. How often will that happen? Well, first off, how often is it true that he's not offered B? Well, that's an easy one, 40% right there. Now let's start with 100 cases and imagine, that look, we look only at the cases where he's not offered job B. We're now cutting down to 40 out of those 100 cases. Out of those 40 cases where he's not offered job B, how, is it, how often does it happen that he is offered job A? Well, this number here says if he's not offered B, he's offered A only a quarter of the time. So in the 40 cases out of 100 when he's not offered B, in one quarter of those 40 cases, that is 10, he is offered A. So how often is he not offered B but is offered A? We just made an argument that said out of the 100 cases, 10 of them would result in not being offered B and being offered A. That's 10 out of 100, or 0.1. Now, that's the reasoning behind it. But let's look at how the math goes, because it's really quite easy. What calculation did I do? I really took this 0.25 down here times this column value here, 0.25 times 0.4 equals 1. What I'm saying is that to move to this table down from this table down here into the corner table you multiply and what you multiply by is the value inside the box. So for example 0.75 times 0.4 which comes out to be 0.3 is the value for this cell. It's just that easy and you can figure out that makes logical sense because as you know these two values have to add up to that one. What else can I do? Well I can do play the same game sideways. It turns out that the exact same reasoning applies. 0.2 times 0.5 equals 1. That is the values out here on the wings times the bucket for that row equals the value in this table here. In the same kind of way, 0.8 times 0.5 ends up being 0.4 and that value goes here. The two values in this row multiplied by 0.5 give the two values in this row just like the two values in this column times 0.4 gave the two values in this column. What else can we get? Can we get this one? Sure we can, because these two values add to 0.6, these two values add to 0.5, and the only thing that could possibly go in that location, therefore, is 0.2. All right. Now, we have some more cells to fit, fit out, but we can use the same reasoning. We said that the values in the outside table times the bucket gives you the values in this column, while the values in this, this outside table times this bucket give you the values in this table, this column, this row, sorry. Well, if going from the outside to the middle involves multiplication, then going from the middle to the outside, either that way or this way, involves division, division by the bucket. I'm calling the bucket this total for row or column. So going vertically, 0.4 times 0.6 is the calculation for here, and that comes out to be two-thirds. 
0.2 divided by 0.6 is the calculation for this cell, and it gives one third. We can go sideways as well. 0.2 divided by 0.5 is 0.4, while 0.3 divided by 0.5 is 0.6. Notice again these rows add up to 1, these columns add up to 1. Multiplication takes you from the corners out here, these outside tables, into this corner table. That goes from here to here. That's multiplication. From here to here is multiplication. To go from this corner one to one of the two wings, we're going to divide. I think of that by saying that this one table is dividing into two. So this way we divide by these numbers. This way we divide by these numbers. Our tables are now complete. What do they tell us? Well, this table is talking about what happens if you know the row event. So what we're saying is this. If you know that A will be offered, then there's a 50, an 80% chance that B will be offered as well. That was one of the stats we were given, which means that if A is offered, there's a 20% chance that B won't be offered. On the other hand, and this is more interesting, if A is not offered, the chance of B being offered goes down to 40%. If A is not offered, the chance of B not being offered is therefore 60%. But here are the ones that are especially useful for our table because Sean started out knowing whether or not B was being offered. If B is offered, there's a two-thirds chance that A will also be offered. And that was a stat that I gave you on that decision tree. If B is not offered, the chance goes down to 25%. And that's what we were just told here in this statement. How about the ones up here? Well, this tells us, for example, that half the time, I'm sorry, that 40% of the time, he will be offered both jobs, A and B that 30% of the time, neither offer will come through. So you better remember that, that then the job C is available. 20% of the time, he'll be offered B but not A. 10% of the time, he'll be offered A and not B. Now these numbers can be used for whatever else we need. Once again, most of the time when you get a decision theory tree that involves a research branch, if the rows are the research outcomes and the columns are the things you're trying to predict, most of the time they'll be giving you this bottom table and this row here, while what you'll need for the tree will be this column here, and this table over here. But as we've seen in this example, that isn't necessarily the case for every problem involving this kind of work.